Um, throughout this talk, I'm going to make reference to the interview that happened between Sam Keen and um, Ernest Becker on his deathbed. How many were here at the first gathering to hear Sam Keen revisit that? Uh, okay, just me and Neil, I guess. There we go. Oh, oh and Dan, right. Um, uh, uh, Ernest Becker had just published The Denial of Death. He was now living in Vancouver, British Columbia, and we'll hear more from Ron Friesen about his experience of Becker in, in Vancouver. Um, and um, the book had been published, and he was diagnosed with uh, cancer that was not fixable. And so he's in the hospital. At that time, Psychology Today was doing a series of interviews with, with people, significant luminaries in the field of psychology. And Sam Keane was sent to interview him. At the begin, and the interview t was two parts. And you can, you can, I really commend that interview to you. You can get it on a, in a hard copy by, by contacting ebf.org and purchase the, the entire script, transcript of, the, of that interview, which was in two parts. And at the beginning of the second part, um, uh, Sam Keane admits that he was speaking to Becker as though he was, uh, that he was in a different human category because he was dying. And so Keane tells Becker what every caregiver of the dying needs to acknowledge. I need to talk to you, he says. I need to talk to you as someone who is not one bit different than I am. Um, uh, few things in life evoke an awareness of helplessness and powerlessness, like being in the presence of someone who's terminally ill. But more often than not, it is the caregivers, and so it is our discomfort with being both helpless and powerless, our discomfort with the awareness that what this person is living through at the moment is something that we too will experience. So we're all dying. And from that place of shared experience, empathy can empower the caregiver to simply be present when he or she feels powerless. Facing the end of life is difficult enough for people who've spent a lifetime denying death, but Becker makes it even harder. He says, we are to live towards death without illusions or personal fabrications or props of any kind. And that's a, another theme from Becker that I think makes faithfulness so essential for end-of-life care. The science of man for Becker strips away all illusions and all character armor in order to refocus one's creative energy. Here's what Becker says to Sam Keane in this interview shortly before he died. It seems to me that the fundamental scientific task is the utter elimination of any consummations that are not empirically based. That is, a complete, stark picture of what the, the human condition is without any consolations, and this seems to me to be the task and the need. So if they, as I'll say later on, when Becker asks Sam Keane what he thought of the book, he said it's like an acid bath. And um, so the experience of living towards death without props, without character armor, without all the fabrications that we ordinarily attach to ourselves, surround ourselves with, so that we can pretend as if we are not finite creatures. Those, are, those need to be stripped away. And if, we, they are allowed, if they allow themselves to be stripped of pretense, those facing death need faithful caregivers to sustain them. When we are naked before death, it's very hard to be alone. It's very hard to be in the company of someone as well because we need very much to trust somebody who's going to see us in our nakedness. But for De Becker, it is a great achievement to face death without illusions and in an entirely honest way. The possibility of facing death without props requires faithful companions who will accompany us through more to a more authentic dying. So how might this vision of living with fewer illusions um, 
about uh, 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 how might it, it enhance the possibility of authentic dying. Ernest Becker's searing honesty about the human condition and his passion for truths that will make a difference reinforce my conviction from a religious point of view that truth frees us and continues to compel me to find ways to live without as, as, with as few illusions as possible. Meaning at the end of life is found in living the truth that I will die. And when we're able to acknowledge that death is imminent, it should be easier to set aside the character armor to live freely and creatively until we die. The most one can achieve, Becker says, in the denial of death is a certain relatedness and openness to experience that which the dying individual sees, um, that, which the, that which an openness is experienced that makes the dying individual less of a driven burden to others. And then he asks this question, which we'll come back to a little later on. How does one lean on God and give over everything to God and still stand on his or her own feet as a passionate human being. How do we live with the recognition that we are vulnerable, dependent, contingent creatures on the one hand, and we are still autonomous agents on, an, on the other, capable of acting? And this is a question that I think is of major significance. The positive result of Becker's ruthless and persistent self-examination is, is relief from the burden of responsibility for our lives. And I think, for me, this is one of the most significant things that I keep learning from Becker. When Becker was asked by Sam Keen on his deathbed how he thought about himself as someone who was dying, Becker said this, well, I suppose the most immediate thing I feel is relieved of the burden of responsibility for my own life. Putting it back where it belongs to whomever, whatever, hatched me. I think this is the most immediate thing I feel. A great sense of relief and trust that eggs are not hatched in vain. Let me read that again. You, you'll get this in a moment. I think this is the most immediate thing I feel. A great sense of relief and trust that eggs are not hatched in vain. In other words, beyond this world, this is still Becker, beyond this world of accident and contingency and terror and death is meaning that redeems. All the unavoidable anxiety we have throughout life about being responsible is let go, given over to God or to whomever we regard as the source of being. And we are able to let go. We are able to put life back where it came from if we trust that our life has not been in vain. Those of you who have sat by the bedside of people near death, um, know well how important it is to come to the end of a life and to believe that it was not in vain. And how important it is to help people discover in whatever small way there was a purpose to their living. And then, and, 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 and if we're able to let go, it, put our life back where it came from, if we trust that our life was not in vain, we have this new sense of, of freedom and relief. That kind of trust, it seems to me, is, is so essential. It precedes the relief that comes. And the way to that trust and hope, and maybe to a little joy, although Becker's not very big on joy, is through the kind of searing honesty that Becker's science of man requires. We are all vulnerable creatures who cannot stand alone. We have our life as a gift, to use it, to even use it up. In, his, in the interview at, with Sam Keen, he says at one point, we're here to be slaughtered. Sam, Neil, LG and I were talking about this last night. How, how do we live with, a, with, 
with an understanding that our life is not our possession. It's not something that we hold. And, 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 but it's, it's, it's a gift given to us to use and to use up. Um, so for those facing the end of life, this invitation to truth-telling and honest self-examination and letting go of the responsibility of my life is going to be easier to do, to, to achieve with, without massive anxiety if faithfulness is promised by the caregivers. We'll be there. We'll stand with you. I know it's a scary thing at the moment. I know it's uncomfortable to ask those hard questions and to envision that we come to the end of life in some ways as we began life, very naked, all, all the stuff that we've added to our existence. Now there's a third theme from Becker um, that is um, connected to the first two and adds a dimension to faithful care at the end of life. Self-transcendence and self-awareness as finite bodily creatures is our existential plight. This is what Becker says over and over again. The existential truth of the human condition is that the human one is, an, is a symbolic self capable of imagining that he or she dies bound to a finite body that, that, that limits our freedom and yet free to imagine ourselves being a little lower than the angels. But living with, the awareness, with an awareness of transcendence is also a promise that sustains and makes everyday heroics possible. Here's how Becker puts it in the interview. I don't think one can really be a hero in any really elevating sense without some transcendental referent like being a hero to God. It is, as Sir Sherwin Nguyen said last night, it's that hope comes from outside. Now that outside may be relationality, may be all kinds of things, but it is not just something in us. I think the most exalted type of heroism, being a hero for the creative powers of the universe and feeling that one has lived to some purpose that transcends one, this is the highest meaning of heroism and why religion gives the individual the validation that nothing else gives them. There may be, as Becker would insist now, more forlornness than joy, more angst than delight, more conflict than peace, more suffering than happiness, to individuals who live without props and without illusions, but there's also a deep sense of the worthwhileness of a life lived. And part of our task, as we'll say a little later on as we bear witness to a story, is to help people discover ordinary heroics, the things that they did, the people they cared for, the books that, the, the budgets they kept, the, the checkbooks they balanced, the simple things that we did that make living in any kind of life um, heroic. I fed my family. I pulled them through hard times in, is testimony to meaning. Those who are dying and caregivers alike need to believe in order to live with the suffering that, printed, that finitude produces that eggs are not hatched in vain. That is our conviction. That's what we carry inside of us. Patients may not always believe that. The people dying may not always believe that their life was not in vain. And they may be reluctant to tell the story of their life because they think it was, it was a waste. It was, a, it, was a full, it was full of crap. If you've read Elio Tolstoy's The Death of Ivan Illich, you know that Illich at the end of his life comes to this terrible moment. It was all, it was an all, em it was all empty, his life. Um, and the content of faithful care is the belief that no life is without meaning because eggs are not hatched in vain. The privilege of faithful care at the end of life is to accompany people as they identify those moments of ordinary heroism. And then, as we shall say in a moment, bear witness to that life. The aim of faithful care at life's end is to help individuals consent to finitude and discover that their life had meaning in a way appropriate to what it is that they believe. Now, um, I think, I think it, uh, uh, what I'd like you to do in a way that is as easy as possible. You got a two there, and if you can turn around and do and do and two, 
just find a person that's close by enough. And I'd love for you to have a conversation for maybe no more than five minutes, and then probably a little less.